Hello, Monetization Nation. Today, I'm joined by the digital marketing icon, Chris Brogan. I really enjoyed this interview and getting to know Chris, and I hope you do as well. Chris is a New York Times bestselling author of nine books, including Trust Agents, which I believe is one of the best business books ever written. He's also the host of The Backpack Show and CEO of Owner Media Group, which sells online training and skill upgrades in the form of webinars and courses. Chris has spoken for or consulted with companies such as Disney, Google, GM, Sony, Coke, and Microsoft. He's part of Tony Robbins' Internet Money Master Series, and Stat Social ranked Chris as the number three power influencer. Forbes listed Chris as one of the must-follow marketing minds, and his website is one of the 100 best websites for entrepreneurs. In today's episode, we're going to discuss how Chris has leveraged the waves of tectonic shifts to achieve success. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. What an honor it is to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Someday I'll catch those other two. I don't even remember how that <laughs> list worked. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on and so thrilled to get a chance to talk with the people that you spend your time with. Yes. Uh, can you just quickly share something with us that you are super passionate about? Every day of my life, I am passionate about helping companies, in, no matter what size, how to try just to be a little more human at a distance. How do we, how do we bring just a wee bit more humanity into what we do? I find that probably even some of the other guests you've interviewed, they're all about you know, how do we mechanize this? How do we automate that? And automation is great, but in my mind, it's always this, to automate is human because then I have more time to connect with people. Yeah. Right before this call, you know what I was doing? I was talking to someone who said they felt bad because it's her wedding anniversary and her husband died a few years ago. Oh. Just calling her. There's nothing to it. There's no business to it. It was a conversation. It has nothing to do with work. It has nothing to do with being Chris Brogan. But I feel better about that than I do talking to somebody about demoing their software. Yeah. So I feel like companies have such an opportunity to reach out and be human. And I think we blow it so many times. And so I'm always looking for how do I help a company systematize that part of their business? How do we act a little more human? Okay, well, before we go on, what are some secrets and strategies you would share for companies about how they can be more human? First off, you know, training out any kind of support platform. So remember that support is always a cost, right? It's never, it's never great to have to spend money on support. So that's why we automate it. We tend to send it to places we you know, have other countries answer the phone, or if we can try to have no phone. The minute someone feels like you're not there to help them when they're having a rough time, that's a problem. So make your support system a lot more human and connectable. Second off, as you're, as you're selling anything in, beyond just features and benefits, make it easy to reach a person. Make it easy to be able to ask those questions you might have. I don't know why we're so terrified of getting somebody in, into a one-to-one -one real-time conversation where that might actually clench getting that card and getting them to put their money down on the product that you sell. I am perpetually impressed with how some companies do that. Tony Robbins, you mentioned uh, the Internet Money Master Series that I was part of. I was in a hotel room one night and I saw one of his infomercials. This is years ago. I saw one of his infomercials and I said, man, I wonder how he does it. So I called. I had the best conversation experience I've ever had for someone trying to sell me one of their info products. Like I never felt so personable on, on an, a scripted, pure for trying to make money kind of a process. And I thought, man, if this is Tony selling to me, then imagine how personable it's going to feel when I'm inside, what I've already paid, you know, imagine how great the whole thing's going to be. And I just think that there's just so many opportunities to not act like a strange robot creature. And we just have to keep looking for them. Yeah. I love that. Hopefully we'll cover that a little bit more in this episode. Um, tell us your story real quick. Give us the Reader's Digest version of, of how you became this amazing entrepreneur and influencer. 
all the way through it's it, stories look so great in retrospect. Like if you, if you go through some years of time and then you look back at, you could pull a thread that wasn't there and make it look great. So I'll do that. Uh, I worked in the telecom business for a long time. I worked in Ma Bell back when that was a thing. So New England telephone, then nine X I worked in landline telecom and then wireless and all along the way, I was always reading and learning from these, these business gurus, you know, the Tom Peters of the world and those sorts of people. I was buying Fast Company magazine and uh, Red Herring when that was a thing in ink. And I thought, this is great. It'd be amazing how business can be done. And like, just nobody was really doing that. It was just, it was, there were so, such outliers, the people who wanted to do unique things with companies. And so I never really got my chance. And then while I was at the wireless telecom, I was, I started a, a project, uh, well, a little bit before leaving the wireless, I I launched my first blog in 1998 when they were calling it journaling and nobody cared. Like it just wasn't that interesting to anybody for years. So it like took me eight years to get my first 100 readers. And then I started a podcast in 05 and I thought podcasting is amazing. Like you can really do some cool stuff and nobody cared. So I started an event called pod camp with my friend, Christopher Penn and on the second day of pod, who I just had lunch uh, meeting with today and uh, over Zoom, we, I met a millionaire, Jeff Pulver, who had run a conference called Vaughn, which was for voice on the net as well as video on the net. And he said, hey, come away with me. Come join the circus. Let's have fun. Let's run a conference. And I said, great, I'm in. I quit. I'll do it. And I immediately started working with some of the biggest brands in the world with Jeff jumped to another company about a year or so later because we were just a little too early. 2006, 2007 was just a little too early for people to think that internet video was super important. And then I worked at another company. When I jumped ship there, I started running a part of their consultancy around things like digital media, social media, how that really nifty new wave, uh, things like Twitter existed. So to catch us up the rest of the way super fast is people started asking me questions as to how it applied to their business. So I would work with uh, Google. I would work with Microsoft, Coke, Pepsi, Titleist, those kinds of companies, all the logos you really want on your slide when you show the companies yeah. you work with. And it was all the same kinds of questions. Like, what do we do with this stuff? Like, is Twitter worth it? And, and uh, I was able to show where there might be a little bit of magic in that old silk hat. And I also showed things like, content marketing and how you could you could reach people by making interesting content or i showed people that community-based interactions were really important and that you can't just throw out a whole bunch of blog posts and hope people like you you've got to try to nurture some opportunity so i've been doing that uh in some form or another since like kind of officially since 2007 i started my first uh, company that i ran 100 myself in 2009 and i've run five or six different iterations of a corporation since uh, and even today, I, I act as a brand strategist for a couple of different companies, and I do content creation for a couple more. So that's what I've been doing. I love stories like that. Um, you mean Chris Brogan wasn't born Chris Brogan. Chris Brogan worked at a telecom company. Chris Brogan evolved and saw opportunities and seized opportunities and and kind of rode the wave of those opportunities to become Chris Brogan. I was early on a bunch of those waves and I never, you know, it's really important. I'm not a big fan of sort of the bleeding edge, like, you know, must be the earliest of adopters. In fact, I poo poo so many platforms that people think are the greatest new thing. Oh, Snapchat is out. This will be great. And I am always like, mm, I don't see it. And so I get this kind of weird grumpy old man uh, appellation as it relates to that. Someone will say this clubhouse, this is the new thing. Is it though? Now that one might be, who knows? I don't know. But I, I could tell you that I think instead of just being early to the pile, what I've been so willing to do over and over and over again is fail, be wrong, look stupid. And I get there faster because of it. Like I'll, I'll try something and I'll be like, oh, that didn't work. And I just say to the world, that didn't work. Here's my next plan. And I got to everything faster than a lot of other people just by being willing to fail in front of everybody and by being willing to try new ways. And I think that that's what separates me from all the people who kind of came up in my spaces. They were still trying really hard to preserve their reputation 
And I built my reputation around falling right down a hole in front of you <laughs> and just showing you what comes next. Yeah. Okay. So you just mentioned that you were really early in writing some of those waves in. And on this show, our, our main focus is digital monetization. Mm -hmm. And we talk about kind of the vehicle we use to help us achieve digital monetization is called, we, we call it tectonic shifts or leveraging tectonic shifts. And so think of, you know, tectonic shifts in geology and how those can cause destruction like earthquakes and volcanoes, or how those same tectonic shifts can cause massive growth like mountain formation. And so we use that analogy and talk about the, the tectonic shifts that are changing the business landscape. And you've lived that, right? You lived the tectonic shift from, from bricks and mortar to internet and from yellow pages to search engines and from desktop to mobile and a hundred other tectonic shifts that, that you've been right on the edge and you've made your career of riding those waves into shore as those tectonic shifts happen. And I, I think that's one of the reasons I, I look up to you so much. And, and one of the reasons I love this book so much trust agents. Um, I think you were ahead of your time with this, just like you were ahead of your time with podcasts, right? And you kind of had to wait for the world to catch up with podcasts. I think the biggest tectonic shift that the business world is dealing with today is credibility marketing. It used to be 20 years ago that businesses would buy a whole bunch of advertising and then use that reach to tell the world how awesome they were. And, and it worked. To, to a great extent, it worked. But today, if businesses do that, it doesn't work. People don't trust what businesses say about themselves anymore. And they're having to go out to much more credible sources. They're having to go to influencers to, to do their marketing or, or customer testimonial videos to do their marketing or word of mouth marketing programs. They're having to get the people that are much more credible than they are to their target audience to communicate their message. And, and that's what you do so good here in Trust Agents is you, you talk about this and you're now in the 10th anniversary edition because you are so far ahead of your time. And I think the world's finally caught up to you on credibility marketing. Nathan, that was a stupid idea writing a 10th anniversary edition. It was, oh man, you go and you look at your book and you're like, I mentioned so many technologies that don't even exist anymore. I was like, what an idiot. Like, why did I say I would do this? It was, you might as well eat an entire package of Oreo cookies and then start flossing your teeth. It was like the worst, but the book needed updating. And yeah. I was very honored that they allowed me to update it. And what, there's so many things we couldn't have predicted. We couldn't have predicted fake news. We couldn't have predicted that in the face of science, humans would be like, nah, I don't think so. And that was just mind blowing. When you talked about influencer marketing, one of the things that I find ongoingly fascinating about things like influencer marketing is that, you know, for instance, I had a few, I had a few brushes with it where a company would, you know, want me to sponsor something or, or, or represent something. And I would say, I, will, I, would, I would make videos and I would say, I don't know why you should go. I did one. It was a, it was a paper shredder and I, I put it on my exercise ball. And so it's like going to fall over the whole time I'm doing the video. And I said, I don't even have any paper in my house. So I'm just going to shred the manual. And I said, well, I shredded the manual. And then I said, oh, I don't know what else I should show you because like I just ate the manual. So I don't know what else I could do. Evidently I could eat paper. That was the video. And <laughs> the humor was good for me. Uh, you know, fellows never sent me another shredder uh, because you know why? Because they shouldn't have sent me the first one. Like because one has a massive following has nothing to do with because they're the right person to talk about your product. The, it's always been broken. It's always been weird and wrong. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, and it's not in front of me. And I was so stunned that it's not. I, I drink out of a Yeti mug. Yeti makes great mugs. They have a great thermos. They cost way more money than the regular similar looking kind of mug. And you know, that whole hot stays hot, cold stays cold. Yep. That's totally true. If I put something cold in it with some ice cubes in the morning at seven at night, I can make it tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. Cause like, that's how good the mug works. I like, I will talk to you endlessly about a stupid mug I drank out of and Yeti could care less cause they're, they're covered. They have enough marketing. They don't need me. But if you're going to look for influence, influencers and influencing, 
It would be so much better if we did it the other way around. Who's talking lovingly about my product? I'll give you an example that I had from me. Uh, last year, I launched a brand new video show in March. And as it was evolving, somewhere in the summer, I made a quick video, had nothing to do with anything. But I said, man, I had not had Johnsonville sausage in a long time. Is that delicious or what? And I said, I wonder if I can get them to sponsor my show. So I start this campaign up where I start pretending Johnsonville's a sponsor. And I'd be like, this episode not sponsored by Johnsonville. And I would show some of their product or something and whatever. Johnsonville got wind of it on Twitter and said, oh, that's hilarious. We'll send you a t-shirt and a postcard or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right? And not interesting. I wrote her back and I said, that's really sweet. Thank you so much. And I'll wear the t-shirts and I will show that postcard. I want you to sponsor. Not because I need your money, because it's going to be a great story. And so a couple of days come and go and she says, you know what? I'm in. What do you want to do? I said, well, there's two ways. One is cheap. You pay like 500 bucks and I'll just mention your name for like a whole month and you'll be happy. The other is you give me like 2000 bucks and I'm going to buy crap tons of sausage for people on my video show. And I'm going to make them make videos of them cooking the sausage. And guess what they're going to do, Nathan? They're going to have fun because it's fun to cook sausage. Who does, you know, besides, you know, vegans, they're going to have a great old time. We did a Johnsonville Appreciation Day video and they loved it. We did a second one because we had so many sausage videos, we couldn't possibly put them in just one episode of the show. This is the stupidest marketing ever. Johnsonville sold 384% better during the pandemic just because people were so like into comfort food. They didn't need me at all. But do I love Johnsonville? And did I influence you know the people who wanted to buy it? By the ton, Nathan. And those videos live forever. So on some, some down day somewhere that they could replay the Johnsonville appreciation video to people, maybe someone will go buy some sausage. That's what has to happen. And as we're looking to make money, and if we're hoping to be an influencer, be an influencer to things you love. Be an influencer yeah. to things that you really stand behind, not that you hope are going to give you some money someday. I love it. That's great, great advice. Let's go to the book for a bit. I have, mm -hmm. I have a bunch of questions from this. Okay. A bunch of things I'd love you to discuss. Um, will you start off talking a little bit about the age of distraction that we're in? Okay. The age of distraction. I mean, think about this. I wrote that book with Julian Smith in 2009. And even back then it was crazy. These little glass rectangles drive our lives, right? These little chocolate bars. We put these beside our head at night as if we're some kind of superhero or a brain surgeon. Oh, oh, we don't want to miss that message that comes in. That's so important. When George Orwell wrote 1984, he could have never predicted that humans would willingly submit so much data to corporations, let alone governments. Yeah. Um, and when it's this whole age of attention and all that, I read an article I hate, you know, I hate showing how many times I'm absolutely not a thought leader. I'm so not. I read an article almost 10 years ago that said that the iPhone was really ahead on this one detail, which is that the notification screen was going to be the new battlefield. And I said, that's so dumb. We're all going to get into our apps. The notification just tells us to go to the app. It's not true. You can reply in notifications. You can, you can take actions in notifications. You can live in that notification for some massive amount of time until you have to dig in deeper to like, I don't know, reply to an email or something. Uh, they were right. I was wrong. Well, if, if the notification screen is the battlefield, and if all of a sudden every single website's like, please, can we send you notifications? And you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> right? I mean, how is like a lowly old email going to get into somebody? How is like somebody's boring as everybody else's boring podcast going to get in? How is video going to work? You talked about tectonic shifts and everything. One, one, of, uh, one of my biggest thoughts is that uh, we just spent a year where video was the thing. We spent a year where uh, the, the world asked Netflix and YouTube, could you throttle down a little? Because we're worried that your bandwidth is going to wreck the internet for all users. And Netflix and YouTube both had to be like, well, okay, right? YouTube is the number two search engine in the world. Well, then why aren't you making video shows? Why don't you have a good video show going? Podcasts are great unless you're stuck at home. You know what I mean? Podcasts are great for people unless you're not commuting somewhere. And so that number went down for a while. Now the infinite dial report for 2021 just came up and said podcasts are up more than before because people are just looking to find the content they want. Nathan, in a world where we're not, 
we're not willing to sit still for an ad, well, then you've got to put some really interesting information in front of us for us to sit still enough to want to consume it. Yeah. And I'm not willing to believe that there's a product that's not, someone wants to sell them, well, I sell toilet seats. I said, toilets could be really cool. You could do some really fun advertising with toilets. And one company, totally true story. They said, we have to test how toilets flush poop. And so we have pretend poops that we send through toilets to see that they work or don't work. Would that be kind of an interesting video? And I said, yeah, especially if they're colorful. Like who wouldn't want to see like a, like a neon orange poop go down a you know toilet? And they made them. And I think that there's, I think there's magic in that. I think that, I think that instead of attention and distraction being the big challenge, it's more, can I find the person that I hope to serve in some way? And that's, that's what we do. That's, that's the goal. That's if you're going to try to be influential in some way, that's how you're going to earn it. All right. Talk to me about the Archimedes effect. The Archimedes effect. This is really funny because for a very long time, my joke has been that that's Julian's chapter. So I don't know what the hell he was talking about, but you know, 10 years in, I finally took me some time. It's about leverage. So Archimedes said, give me a lever, uh, you know, of any size and I can move the world. So basically you figure out where you can make some kind of a change. It's very much your tectonic plates. Uh, And if I can push on that, I can change the world. And so what you're looking for is, can I do something once that's so impactful that I don't have to do it multitudes of times? So what we were pointing towards is things like blogging, video making, podcasting. If you make an interesting interview that a lot of people can take benefit of, you and I talking, maybe there's something good in there. If you just keep it to yourself, then you're going to get one use out of it. If you bring it to everyone and everyone's like, oh man, I'm glad Nathan asked him those questions. Okay. Let's talk about the term trust agents itself. Um, I, I love this title that you gave to, to people who apply these principles. Can you tell us a little bit more about where that term came from and what it means to be a trust agent? So it was my dumb idea. Mm-hmm. And Julian said, what's that mean? And I said, doesn't matter. Just say, okay. And he said, okay. <laughs> and the idea of a trust agent was simply this idea that there's company, there's faces of companies, you know, back in the days of Google, a little bit older, it was Sergey and Larry all the time. Right. And then they brought in Eric Schwartz. And people thought, well, I guess that that's the people, but that's not who we got information from. In my world, we got it from Matt Cutts. And then when she was a director of marketing, we got it from Marissa Mayer before she ran off and ran you Yahoo for a minute. And, and we would learn more from a Matt Cutts. So he was our trust agent, meaning we were the person, we trusted that person to represent that company. For years, there were these solo acts inside companies doing this. Uh, Lionel Menchaca at Dell was Lionel at Dell. And Lionel changed the culture there when he was there, which was that uh, it was Dell was very unresponsive. They were crappy at customer service. They were incredibly bad at getting back to you and making something happen. Um, Frank uh, Eliason was Comcast Cares. He was at Comcast Cares, which he started with no one's blessing on Twitter and suddenly raised that company's perception of customer service value massively when most people considered Comcast worse than a prison as far as like great customer response. Yeah. They thought it was the worst. And so Frank Eliason single-handedly fixed that. And then eventually they gave him a team. And we, we had names of this for everybody, Morgan Johnston at JetBlue. Um, there's just all these names that makes me feel old, like OG, because they're like a decade or more old now and that none of these people work at these places anymore. Yeah. Um, but what happened was companies had the opportunity and then most of them skipped past it. Most of them didn't do it. They had the opportunity to build relationships that would, would be more valuable than any kind of marketing person could ever be because it was direct response uh, companies will. You know, hey, Southwest Air, at Southwest Air on Twitter. Hey, at Southwest Air, you know, I have those green tickets that sort of give me a free ticket. But if I don't bring the actual paper ticket and I have a problem, I really need to get home. My kid's sick and I have to use this ticket now. It's kind of like my emergency way home. No problem. We get you covered. And next thing you know, you're handled. And it's done in the public eye through something like Twitter. And everyone feels that kind of warmth, like, oh, the world's better because this person did a thing. So Nathan, that's what was going on. And that's the name we gave us, trust agents. These are the people that inspire trust in a system that might otherwise not always have that trust. 
Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, we need to ride the waves of tectonic shifts. Number two, we need to be more human and personalized in our businesses. Number three, people don't trust what businesses say about themselves anymore. This means we have to find much more credible sources, such as influencers, to promote our products. Number four, just because someone has a massive following doesn't mean they're the right person to talk about our product. We need to find an influencer whose following is our target audience. Number five, we live in an age of distraction. We have to constantly fight for the time of our customers. In order to capture their attention, we need to show them what value we offer as fast as possible. If you enjoyed this interview like I did and want to learn more about Chris, please connect with him on his LinkedIn uh, profile or his website, chrisbrogan.com. You can also find his books on amazon.com and watch his video podcast on YouTube. And there's links to all of those on the blog post for this episode. Do you want to be a better digital monetizer? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, you can get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, you can subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast and YouTube channel. And number three, please follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. What tectonic shifts have you adapted to? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in riding the waves of tectonic shifts. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.